All right, so as everyone continues to log on, we'll get started. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, a bookseller with Politics and Prose. We're live with Craig Melvin and John Meacham discussing POPs, learning to be a son and a father. You can follow the link in the chat to purchase a signed copy directly from us at Politics and Prose. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the screen. We'll try to get to everyone's questions in the last portion of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we run short on time. Additionally, we're happy to offer closed captioning for this event via Zoom's auto captioning service. To enable captions, click the CC live transcript icon at the bottom of the screen. Before we begin, we do wanna thank all of you out there for joining us. We're really grateful to our family of loyal customers who keep our business and our spirits afloat. It's my pleasure to introduce this incredible book. For Craig Melvin, this book is more an investigation than a memoir. It's an opportunity to better understand his father, to interrogate his family's legacy of addiction and despair, but also transformation and redemption, and to explore the challenges facing all dads, including Craig himself, a father of two young children. Growing up in Columbia, South Carolina, Craig had a fraught relationship with his father. Lawrence Melvin was a distant, often absent parent due to his drinking, as well as his job working the graveyard shift at a postal facility. Watching sports and tinkering on Lawrence's beloved but unreliable 1973 Pontiac were two ways father and son connected. But as Lawrence's drinking spiraled out of control, their bond was stretched to the breaking point. Fortunately, Craig had a loving, fiercely protective mother who held the family together. He also had a series of surrogate father figures in his life, uncles, teachers, workplace mentors, who by their examples helped him figure out the kind of person and father he wanted to be. Pops is the story of all these men and of the inspiring fathers Craig had met reporting his Dad's Got This series on the Today Show. Pops is also the story of Craig and Lawrence Melvin's long journey to reconciliation and understanding and of how all these experiences and encounters have informed Craig's understanding of his own role as a dad. Craig Melvin is an award-winning news anchor on NBC News Today, a co-host of Third Hour Today, an anchor on MSNBC Live, and a host of Dateline. His breaking news coverage and reporting appears across all NBC News and MSNBC platforms. Melvin will be in conversation with John Meacham, a renowned presidential historian, contributing writer to the New York Times Book Review, contributing editor at Time, and Pulitzer Prize winning author. On behalf of Politics and Prose, please join me in welcoming Craig Melvin and John Meacham. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hugely appreciated. I, I'm here mostly as a service project because I'm a graduate of the University of the South in Sewanee, Tennessee, which is a much superior institution to this uh, two-year school, I think, uh, in uh, South Carolina called Wofford. Wofford. Uh, are you all four years now, Craig? Uh, we are. We're four years. We just went four years a couple of years ago. We okay. Good, 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 good. Uh, but uh, I'm honored to be here with, with my friend, Craig Melvin, uh, and uh, this remarkable book, uh, a, an honest and uh, compelling story uh, that's uh, resonant any day, but particularly this weekend. Uh, tomorrow being being Father's Day. And Craig, I just want to uh, start uh, very basically kind of a Charles Dickens question. Tell us your story. You were born. What was mom like? What was dad like? Uh, walk us through the first uh, 10, 15 years. So, John, first of all, let me just thank you as well. I, you know, I know you're working on at least two or three books right now, I'm sure. So I know how busy you are. I appreciate you carving out some time on a Saturday afternoon at that um, to, to do this. So thank you, my friend. Um, I, you know, I was born in, in 79 and my parents got married three years later. Um, I found out probably 15 years ago that for the first few years of my life, I had a different last name. I was a, a pleasant surprise. My mom and dad met in the 70s. I, I found out during the course of the research for this book they met at a baseball game. My grandfather, um, who died in 77, he used to play sort of rec league baseball. And uh, my dad played in the same rec league. And uh, my mother and her sister would occasionally go to games. 
And um, and my dad, five years older than, than my mom, mind you, uh, they met at one of her father's baseball games and became friendly. Uh, it would be years until they, they started dating. My dad, in the first line of the book, I, I write about uh, how he was born in a, a prison in West Virginia, a federal facility. A fun fact, the same federal facility that, um, that Martha Stewart uh, did her time in. Uh, Billie Holiday served time in the same prison. Uh, it's, it's apparently uh, renowned for its progressive approach uh, to, to rehabilitating. So, so my dad did not know who his father was until he was almost a teenager. And as you might imagine, that shapes and molds you in myriad ways. Um, so he grew up in Casey, South Carolina. Casey's outside Columbia. Um, and he did not interact with a single white person uh, until he was in high school. Um, and uh, my mother lived a similar life growing up. She uh, grew up in the projects and was evicted a number of times from the projects. They just moved to a different project. So they meet in the 70s. They ended up getting married in 82. Um, and I grew up, John Meacham, I, it, it was a, a perfect little childhood. I grew up in a, and I write about it in the book. I mean, you couldn't have scripted it any better. The, the, the folks next door, they were, they were white. The folks across the street were white. Folks on the other side of us were black. There was, some, there was a Lebanese family on the corner. There was a Chinese family that lived across from them. There were some Italians that lived across the street to the left. I mean, it was a, you know, as, as neighborhoods go in the 80s, uh, it could not have been more diverse. And I found out during the course of, of, of research for the book that that was by design. My mother uh, went out of her way to make sure that uh, we had the kind of childhood where we were exposed uh, to things and people that she had not been exposed to. Um, so I, I grew up, I grew up like that. I mean, we were, um, things were fine for, for most of, I'd say the eighties. My dad was one of these guys that would occasionally have a drink or two, uh, up until about, you know, 86, 87. Um, and then he started drinking more. He worked third shift at the post office. He was a mail clerk. Um, and so as you know, I mean, that means you, you pretty much sleep during the day because you're working at night. And he would come home and, and crack open a cold one and that led to a, a, another cold one. And then he's a six pack in and then he would pass out. And this was sort of the routine for, for much of my childhood. It was fine until um, I was a teenager and he started to drink more. And then his mother got sick and he started to drink more. Um, and then when he retired uh, five years ago, um, you work third shift, you don't develop interests and hobbies. You don't have a lot of lasting friendships. Um, so he started drinking even more and to the point where he would get blackout drunk. And um, he got into a car accident in 2018. And, and we used that as an impetus to try and get him some help. My childhood um, was um, filled with happy memories, uh, primarily because of my mother. Um, my father was, was there physically, uh, but was not there emotionally or certainly not spiritually. Um, so it's, it, 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 I tell folks all the time, I think you can be motivated just as much, if not more so, by negative examples um, mm -hmm. as you can by positive examples. So for me growing up, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to be or what I wanted to do, um, but I saw my father and I knew uh, from an early age, I did not want to be like him. And as I got older, I, I grew to resent him more and more. I, I was fairly angry on the inside as a teenager and then in, in, into my 20s as well, um, because I just thought, oh, dad's a drunk. You know, he's weak. If he really wanted to get this monkey off his back, he could. And it wasn't until, you know, probably in my, my late 20s, as I started my career in journalism and started to do stories about, you know, people struggling mightily with addictions that I, I came to understand that what my father was dealing with um, wasn't weakness. It, it was an illness. It was a disease that afflicts millions of Americans. Um, and so I started to view him differently. And then, you know, you have your own children and you start to view, you really start to view your father differently. 
Um, so it's, you know, it's my, my childhood was, it was, it was really great. I little league and, you know, my mom in her quest to expose us to things, she, she made me play the violin uh, against my will in elementary school. Um, I started to participate in oratorical contests when I was in middle school um, because she wanted to make sure that the way that I, I spoke didn't necessarily reflect where I was from. Um, and, and also come to find out there's a lot of scholarship money available um, because you don't have a lot of kids clamoring to compete in oratorical contests, as you might imagine. So I was able to, uh, to pick up some scholarship money to, to help uh, fund that, uh, that mediocre education it offered. Um, <laughs> so I, I was, I, it was, it was one of those things where, John, I think because my dad was who he was, I tried um, doubly hard to get his attention and win his affection and, and, and his approval. Didn't realize it obviously at the time, uh, but, but that's, that's what I was doing. You know, uh, I remember talking to President Obama, uh, then Senator Obama in 07, 08. Uh, you know, he met his father once, as you know, uh, when he was about 11. And there's a remarkable picture of it. Uh, they're in the airport in Hawaii and uh, Obama's holding, President Obama is holding on incredibly tight to this, this elusive figure. And he, Obama uses a line that has been around in the vernacular that everyone is either trying to live up to his father's expectations or make up for his father's mistakes. Mm. Does that resonate with you? Uh, the second part does, yes. I, 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 even, even now, um, you know, it's, but it's funny though, during the course of the book, John, I asked my dad, and that was the highlight, interviewing my father for more than four hours, um, peppering him with questions. He answered all of them, uh, which I was pleasantly surprised by, although there were a couple of questions where I, I thought, well, maybe I, sh I, in hindsight, shouldn't have asked that. But I asked him, um, I, said, I said, Pops, what's the most money you ever wasted? He thought about it for, for, for a little bit and he said, I'll tell you, it's $1,500 in 1986. Most money I'll ever waste. I said, what'd you spend $1,500 on in 1986? He said, that's how much it cost to put my daddy in the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that moment, I realized, oh, that explained it all. Uh, he had no relationship with his dad until he was almost a teenager. And uh, my grandmother had uh, uh, five children, three different men, and and she was a bootlegger and she ran liquor, she ran numbers um, and she loved love. And um, so my dad came along and he was the youngest. And, and by, that, by that point, it, it, she hadn't checked out I and mean, she loved my dad, but, but there was only so much, there's only so much love to go around. Yeah. And so he had heard through neighborhood kids that his dad was a guy that used to be around the neighborhood that worked down at the rail station. And my dad was, you know, 10, 11. And uh, one afternoon he decides to go up to this guy that he's known in the neighborhood. He's known for years, uh, just sort of as a, as a friend of the family. And he goes up to him. He said, Hey, you're my daddy. And uh, Curtis Amaker was his name. And, and uh, he said, who told you that? And my dad, you know, said, ah, oh, you know, I just heard that you might be my daddy. And he said, yeah, yeah, I am. And that was that. My dad said after that, the dynamic changed. Um, he would rarely acknowledge him. When my father got older and he uh, went into the military and started working at the post office and he had a few bucks in his pocket, he would occasionally seek him out to ask him for money. That was it. There was no emotional uh, connection. There, there, that was it. He, he used my dad as an ATM back then. Um, and toward the end of my grandfather's life, uh, he drank himself uh, to the point of sickness and then drank himself to the point of death. And he, he died pretty much in squalor by himself. And he had alienated himself to the point that my father was about the only person who would pay for a funeral. And so my dad felt this sense of obligation because it was his blood that, um, that, that he should at least cover the cost of a cheap funeral. But I, I realized while I was working on the book, John, that, that 
the expectations that I had for my dad when I was a teenager, even before that, the expectations that I had were wholly unrealistic because you cannot be something that you've never seen. My dad did not, he didn't have a father. His father was, he didn't know his dad was. And then when his father was around, the dynamic that they had was not the father-son dynamic that, 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 that should be had. So, so in my dad's eyes, he was doing a pretty decent job. He was providing for his family. He didn't run out on his kids or my mom. Uh, he was comparing himself to his dad. And, and I, as I got older, I've, I've, I felt guilty that I, had, I was holding my father up to this standard that he wasn't capable of, of meeting. And, and so as I got older, I would bust my hump. Uh, even when I was in local news, I, I, I worked in the same town where my parents lived. Um, and I think that was uh, part of God's design. Um, and, and my dad, um, he would watch me on the news. He would never talk about it. It was never, it was never discussed, but he, he, he watched. And when I moved to DC, he couldn't watch me anymore. And then I, I moved up, up to, to New York and I'm on, on TV a lot. And during the course of the book, I, I, um, I, I asked, I talk about this interview that I had with him where I asked him some innocuous question about, uh, the news. And, and he revealed that he watches me every day. Um, and I'm on a lot, three hours most days. And he watches from the time I'm on to the time I'm done. He watches the, 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 the date lines that come on in the middle of the night. And if I'm not there, he'll ask my mom, where am I? He, he's, never, he's never mentioned it, never brought it up. And I, I asked him about it. I said, well, Pops, why, why, wouldn't, you, why wouldn't you tell me that you're, you're watching? Or so why would I tell you? Well, of course I'm watching you. You're my son. I love you. Um, that's where we are now. Yeah. 20 years ago, John Meacham, I, 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 the first time I remember my father saying, I'm proud of you and I love you, was my college graduation from Wofford. That's the first time I remember it. There was no hugging growing up. There's no kissing. There's no affection. Um, but again, it's because he wasn't capable of it. He hadn't seen it. So how did you get to where you are with your kids? Um, my mother. My mother played the role of mom and dad for, for a good swath of my life. And she, she showed me and my younger brother what it was like uh, or what it should be like uh, when, you, when you're a parent. That unconditional love, uh, running a shuttle service. You know, she, she ferried us around all those activities uh, despite being a school teacher. Uh, and at one point, picking up a second job to help make make ends meet. Um, so we had we had that example. And I had examples of from you know uncles and coaches and teachers, and I I, I started uh, to to piece together uh, what a what a man should look like uh, based on uh, my mom and, and other men who were around me. Um, and and so you know. And, and then I had professional mentors. I'd write in the book about a guy named Jim Vance in Washington, D.C., who sort of took me under his wing. Um, I watched a lot of television. I, I write about my borderline obsession uh, with Heathcliff Huxtable in the book. Not Bill Cosby, but Dr. Huxtable. The distinction's important. And, and sort of using that as a model of, of for what a dad should be. So going back to my earlier point about, you know, having a negative example, I try desperately to be uh, physically present at every event my child has. If, if I'm not traveling for work, I'm at the soccer game. I'm at the, the, the we had a great uh, gymnastics recital on Sunday where my daughter, despite, uh, now granted she is, she's four, but we've been sending her to gymnastics for a year, literally a full year. The lessons aren't cheap. And we go for this recital. It's been built up. They've been building it up for months. And I'm there front row, want to get there early. And she's on the little balance beam. And you do some bunny hops. And, and then you're supposed to do a tumble. She hops twice, John Meacham. And she falls right off the balance beam. And I turned to my wife. I said, oh, yeah? Oh, she's been doing this for a year? And this is what we've paid for? I was very, But anyway, uh, I digress. So I, I try to I try to be there because my dad wasn't there, and it's. But to that point, John, I, a couple of weeks ago, my, my folks were up, and my my dad now, you know, he's uh, he's all in as a grandfather, 
and we're at the soccer game, my, my son's soccer game, Saturday morning, 8.30. He hadn't scored a goal all season. He's more of a defender. 30 seconds into the game, kid you not. Uh, dribble, 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 shoot, score. Uh, my son scores the first goal of the game. Uh, and my dad and I are on the sideline, we're high fiving. Like you would have thought that kid like won the green jacket at Augusta. I mean, it was, but it was also, um, and I said to my wife later, cause I got a little, I got a little, little emotional after, um, because I know that he's making up for lost time, uh, which is great. I'm here for it, but it's a, um, it's, it's, it's been fun to watch. It's fun and it's redemptive, but are you a little angry about it? I was, if we're being honest, I was, I, I was, um, seeing what he's capable of now. Um, yeah, I, I was, in fact, I would say I was angry probably up until 2018 when, when he finally agreed to, to get some, some professional help. Um, because there would be these, these periods of, 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 of engagement, um, where he would, there'd be some sort of incident. We'd have too much and we'd, we'd pull him aside or someone would pull him aside. And he's like, all right, I won't, I won't drink for, and he'd go, yeah, he could go a week or two and he was fine. Um, and when, and in those periods, he was like, he is now all the time. Um, and, and so we would sort of get lulled into this sense of complacency and we would think, oh, okay, maybe dad's turned the corner. And then, you know, a few weeks later, something else would happen. And, and then in, in, in 2018, when he got in this car accident and we became uh, very concerned that his drinking had gotten to a point where he was going to hurt someone else. He was going to get into an accident and, and hurt or kill someone. Um, and we, and we staged this intervention and, and, and that's when he came out a different person. But before that, I would get angry because I would see him sometimes with my son, especially my daughter wasn't born yet, but I would see him with my son and he was that, that, that sort of doting grandfather. And he was, you know, he would watch the game with, with, with Dow and even with his other grandchildren. I have a, a niece who, um, at, at the age of two. Uh, she was diagnosed with a rare form, and I write about it in the book, but she was diagnosed with a rare form of, of pediatric cancer, uh, Ewing sarcoma. And, um, and it actually sort of led to my dad retiring early, in hindsight, I think, um, because he wanted to be at all the treatments. He wanted to be at her bedside when my, my younger brother had to go to work or his wife had to go to work or, or just to give them a break. He was, uh, I call it a ministry of presence uh, for them. And for six months, nine months, while she fought, um, he was right there. More than anybody else in our family, my dad was there. So we saw what he was capable of. We saw the, this, this love that he, that he had for his granddaughter. Um, and, and when she died at the age of three, I think that was something that just, uh, he had a hard time coping with that. And so he, he coped uh the the only way he knew how to cope and and that sort of led to another another downward spiral and i i, I we be, i became angrier with him after that after she died and after the drinking had gotten worse because we had all seen the kind of man he could be so how run us through these um you mentioned jim fans uh run us through the folks who advertently or inadvertently filled that vacuum for you, help fill that picture out. I, I, it's funny because at different points in my life, they, they all played different roles. It was as if God sent them to me uh, because he knew what I needed at that time. And when I started in DC, I was doing the weekend news. Um, I was, um, I was intimidated to say the least. I come from Columbia, South Carolina. I'm in Washington, DC. And, um, I thought for a bit, I might, I might be out of my depth. And they sit me down with this guy named, named Jim Vance had been there for 40, 45 years. And I go into his office and he's smoking a cigarette. And I mind you, this is 2008 where it was very much against the law to smoke inside. <laughs> smoking a cigarette. Um, and I mean, he's, he's, and he's, he's, um, as they would say, keeping it real about all of it. He's talking about race. He's talking about class. He's talking all. I mean, it's talking about heavy stuff at four in the afternoon. And 
Um, and, and, and we became a good friend so much so that I, 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 I um, was one of his eulogists when he passed away um, a few years ago, but he taught me how to be comfortable in, in one's own skin that you, you don't have to, to play a part uh, when you're a journalist, when you're on television, you can be who you are, but to, but to, to be that, to do that, you have to know who you are. Um, and, and so he helped me get there professionally, but before Vance, I mean, I had a, I had a, um, a coach, um, who was also a high school, um, administrator named Larry Kears, who got me involved in an organization called Key Club. And, um, he helped expose me to this, this youth service organization that became very much a part of, of my teenage years. Uh, I had a teacher named Mike Fanning, who's now a state legislator, actually, in South Carolina, who's my AP world history teacher, um, who, I, in fact, I, the very first story I did when I was a high school reporter at WIS in Columbia, I did this story on my favorite teacher because he was so innovative. I mean, if you were studying the Chang Dynasty, he's dressed in costume and and, and you're eating Chinese food, which again, in high school, it made sense. Looking back on it now, it, 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 there's no connection. But he was trying to really bring the lessons to life. Sure, sure. So I do this, this story on him, and I won an Associated Press Award for the story I did, I did on my favorite teacher, uh, which led to the news director taking an interest in me, which led to my first job. Uh, Mike Fanning was, was, was very instrumental. He was the first person that really got me interested in politics. Um, we had to, one of our assignments in the, in the AP government class was to, to work on a campaign. And I had volunteered to work on a, a campaign in 1994. There's a guy uh, running for Congress in Columbia, South Carolina, in a, a newly created congressional seat. Uh, it was a neighbor of my, my aunt, a guy named Jim Clyburn. And <laughs> I worked on Jim Clyburn's campaign. Um, as a volunteer for a few months, and I, I got to know politics. And so years later, when I go to Wofford, the president of the college at the time had taken an interest in me, a guy named Joe Lassane. Uh, his, his son, Joey Lassane, uh, worked in a fellow named Fritz Holling's office. And uh, one day I was working in the president's office, and, and Dr. Lassane comes out. I said, you know, I think you should go up to D.C. and, and, and spend some time working in Sarah Holling's office. I was like, yeah, sign me up. I'll go. And, and so I go up to D.C. And, and while I was there, I stayed with my father's brother, uh, my uncle James, who I write about a fair amount in, in the book, who was really of all of the examples that I had. My father's oldest brother um, really filled the void. He was, um, I mean, just quintessentially cool. He was he worked in D.C. Uh, for most of my life. And when he would come home, he was always driving a Cadillac, John. And, and when you're a black kid in the 80s, nothing screams status yeah. like a Cadillac. Yeah. And so growing up, you were like, oh, he's, he's clearly a millionaire. He's always got a new Cadillac. What, we, what I didn't realize back then is that he was a civil servant. Uh, so he wasn't a millionaire, uh, but he didn't have young children. So he could afford a nice car. The disposable income principle, yeah. <laughs> so I just had all these, these men along the way. And I talked to some of them for the book. And, and I discovered that a few of them knew that I needed a, um, a good role model. I, I needed an example. I needed someone to fill the void. Um, and, and they all did it willingly. I've, I've, been, I've been so blessed and so fortunate in, in that regard. Talk to me about your faith. You've mentioned it a couple of times. Um, what is God to you? Where are we, how are you raised? What do you? What does that mean to you? Oh, John, I, it's a. Um, I, I spend a good portion of the book on this as well because it is such a, a huge part of of who I was and who I am. I um, and again now looking back on it, it was by design. My mother, we grew up in. She grew up in this this small country church in Casey, South Carolina, and. Um, and her mother, my grandmother, same church, all of my aunts and uncles, same church, New Life Baptist Church. And about a mile up the road, my, my father's mother, my grandma, who's the bootlegger and who ran numbers later in life, uh, she found the Lord. So by, by the time I came along, she was either at church, going to church or coming from church. That was it. Like she, Grandma Reen, as we called her, was always at Mount Pleasant Baptist Church. So on Sundays, 
get up in the morning, eight o'clock. We were at Sunday school. After Sunday school, we stayed um, at New Life Baptist Church and, you know, Black Baptist Church services. On a good Sunday, it's two hours. On a bad Sunday, it's two and a half, maybe three. And then oftentimes after church, there would be a break. And then there was some sort of program at church, whether it was a, a choir anniversary or the pastor's anniversary or revival. Um, we were always at church. And then I was in the choir because my grandma was in the choir. I love being around grandma. I joined the choir. So during the week, you got choir practice. So we we're at church at least two, sometimes three days a week. And on Sundays, we're in church five, six hours a day. And in the book, I recount this, this comedian. I, I forget who it was years ago. I think it was Chris Rock. And, and I identified with, with, with his relationship with God at a young age, because I remember being seven or eight. I'm at church probably four o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. I've been there for six or seven hours. And I'm wedged between my grandmother and my mother. I just remember thinking, just let me go to hell. I'll just, there's no way. There's no way it can be worse than this. <laughs> but I, I, was, I, was, I was in church for so long that at some point, I guess by osmosis, I picked up the faith. And I got to a point when I was eight or nine that I, after church, we'd always go to my grandma's house for Sunday dinner. And my grandma cooked the same meal every Sunday. And we just sat and ate until we couldn't eat anymore. Uh, my dad was never there, but my mother would go to his mother's mother-in-law's house every Sunday. And so I would, I would commit the pastor's sermon, a good chunk of it to memory. And I would go to my grandma's house and I would, I would get on the porch and I would perform, uh, what I'd just seen in church so much so that for, I'd say the first 12 years of my life, uh, there were a good half dozen, maybe a dozen folks in the church or part of my family who thought I was going to become a, a minister. But I, I remember the prayer. Reverend Emmy James would pray the same prayer every Sunday. So we heard it for, you know, 20 years. And it was, oh, Lord, our God, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our forefathers who've gone on before us. Holy is thy name and all there. And he would go on and on. And my younger brother, as he got older, um, we, we knew the, the script from beginning to end. So we would start to, to sort of mimic the pastor in church, which drew an immediate like back slap uh, <laughs> from my mother or grandmother in church. But as I got older, John, that, that the, the seeds of the faith that were planted at New Life Baptist Church uh, finally began to grow as, as I got older and my relationship um, my relationship with God, it grew and it's grown the older that I've gotten. And, you know, when I was younger, I, I, I would treat Jesus as a genie, you know, God, I, I really, I really need this I, in college. I really need this a, or for me, I really need this B, uh, because I, <laughs> I, I, wanted Jesus to, I, I was realistic with Jesus. Uh, but, but as I, as I got older, uh, my relationship has grown. And it's grown, it's grown at different times in different ways. And when my brother, uh, my older brother became, became sick, he was a Baptist minister, also went to Wofford. And um, he, so he was a Baptist minister and, and his faith from the time that he was, you know, probably seven or eight, there was no question that he was, becoming, he was going to become uh, a, a member of the clergy. Um, but as, as, as he got sick, and we would talk. Um, I, I began to understand the relationship that, that one should have uh, with, for me, and again, different people believe different things, but the, the relationship that one should have uh, with Jesus and his father. Um, and now when I, with my own children, uh, it's, it's, um, it's, grown, it's grown even more. And so I, I would assume by the time I'm you know, 70, 75, I'm, I'll, I'll be where I should be. Hmm. Good for you. Um, what is your best advice to both fathers and sons? I'll start with sons because this is something that I've come to realize over the past few years. Um, I was really hard on my dad um, for a long time. I was really hard on him because I didn't understand 
Um, I didn't understand why he didn't want to always be there because I was a really cool kid. My younger brother was a really cool kid. I didn't understand why he didn't always want to be at the basketball games or the oratorical contest, front row cheering me on. Um, and, and, and consequently, I lashed out. You know, in my teenage years, in my 20s, we would have, you know, these screaming matches and, and I, would, I, would, I was mean to him because I didn't understand the sickness. Um, so my advice to sons um, and daughters as well, go easy on your parents because we're all doing the best that we can with what we have. No mother, no father, you know, decides, makes a conscious decision to be a shitty mom or shitty dad. No one does that. Um, and I didn't realize that until I had my own children and I started spending some time with the therapist to help me understand that. Um, go easy on your parents. Uh, forgive them. I had to get to a point, John Meacham, where I forgave my dad. Not for my dad's sake. I had to forgive him for my sake. I had to forgive him for me. Um, and, and ever since then, I, I have been, um, I'm a little lighter than I was just four or five years ago as a result of that. So my advice to, to, children, my advice to, 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 to kids would be, um, go easy on your parents and understand that we're all doing, the, they're all doing the best they can. My advice to parents, and it's, it's funny because I think that um, the series that I do for the show, uh, Dad's Got This, where I've had the opportunity to, to really spend some time with dads all over the country who are extraordinary in, in, in a variety of ways. There's a, I spent some time in a prison, I write about in the book, at a prison in uh, California, uh, Salinas Valley State Prison. This guy, uh, we're out on the yard and, and we're at this camp. They created this camp where these kids can come and spend a week with their fathers who are in prison. They're never getting out. Um, and they bust the kids in uh, and they do crafts and sports and they play games. And it's really like nothing, nothing you'll ever see. And, and they get them for eight or nine hours every day for five days. And so we went out to, to showcase this program and I'm, I'm spending some time with this gentleman on the yard. And I said to him, I said, well, what would you say uh, to folks who are watching this, who are going to say, you know, for what this guy did, he shouldn't be allowed to spend time with his daughter or son, you don't deserve this. What would you say? And, and, and he's, you know, he's tearing up and I'm tearing up at this point. And he's without missing a beat said, they're probably right. I don't deserve it, but my daughter does. Mm. My son does. They deserve it. They, they deserve to know who their daddy is. Um, I deserve, they deserve the opportunity to have a parent in their lives. Um, and so I've been able to meet some really remarkable dads and, and you start talking to, to other, other parents, John Meacham, and you realize we're all figuring it out. Like no one's got it figured out. And I, I, before I had my son, I would read these books and, and you know, you, you try to apply some of these things. And then you get to a point where you realize that a lot of the folks who write these books, I don't think they've ever had children. <laughs> uh, but, but, but you learn along the way and you apply the lessons that you learn along the way. And I also lean on my parents a lot now. I ask my, my parents uh, questions about, about parenting. Um, so it's, we're all just doing the best that we can, John Meacham, you know? You yeah. No, we are. Uh, with, with grace and hope. Uh, so let's go to some questions um, from our folks. Um, Michelle Taylor wants to know, uh, during the research process of writing the book, were you able to trace your family's past? Did you find any interesting or eye-opening stories about your family's genealogy? Oh my God, I did. Um, and, and I actually didn't include um, at the request of a family member, uh, one nugget um, about um, a, a child who was lost uh, at, an, at an early age, a child died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. And um, I was asked not to include it. I didn't include it in the book. Um, I, found, I found out about that. This was one of my grandmother's uh, children. Um, I found out a lot about my, my dad's childhood that I didn't know, um, which, you know, you start 
when you start to find out more about your parents' childhood, it really explains how they came to be who they are. You know, my, my dad, you know, in this, in, in this particular neighborhood, when kids, you know, kids can be cruel and say terrible things, um, but kids would call him a jail baby and they would poke fun at the fact that, that he was born in, in prison. And because they, this was a tight knit community, everyone kind of knew it. And, um, and I didn't know that. And my dad had a terrible inferiority complex growing up. Um, he did not enjoy social settings where there were uh, strangers. He didn't, he didn't like crowds. Um, and that kind of explains why. Um, and my mom, you know, my mom grew up in, a, in an abusive household. My grandfather, her, her father, my grandfather on both sides, uh, he was a drunk. In fact, when he died in 1977, um, he had been in and out of a homeless shelter in Columbia. He, he died pretty much on the streets, uh, estranged from the family. Um, and my mother, uh, because of that, she was the oldest of four, still is the oldest of four. Um, she was called upon to help rear her younger siblings. And she gets pregnant with me in 1978. Um, she's at that point, uh, just out of college, and she's having to, to worry about me, having to help take care of her three younger siblings. And then she gets married. My father becomes who her father was, uh, minus the abusive part, but um, a drunk. Um, and so she ends up having to take care of him. Um, and she's still helping to take care of her younger siblings. Then her mother gets sick. My grandmother, later in life, she becomes her caretaker. My grandmother moves in with her. And I said to my, I interviewed my mother for about three hours, four hours for this book. And as she's sort of telling her story, I, I, I said to her, I said, I didn't realize that you'd been taking care of someone for about 45 years. And she said, you know what? I didn't realize it either until you just said it out loud. Um, and so it's, I, I, I just, I would encourage John Meacham, even if you're not going to write a book, I would encourage everyone um, to sit down with their mother or father, if they're fortunate enough to have both of them alive, and ask them all the questions they've ever wanted to ask and record it. And one of the reasons that I, I say this, I never heard my, my grandfather's voice on either side, never heard their voice. And my kids and their kids and their kids, if they so choose, They'll have hours of, of their, their ancestors mm. telling their stories and their own words. And you don't realize how powerful that is until you start to, to do something like this. You've become a biographer. No, I have not. You're Welcome a biographer. Aboard. Welcome aboard. <laughs> uh, good question from Scott Buchanan. Do you think your dynamic with your father made you work harder in other aspects of your life? having something that felt lacking made you try to fill your life with professional academic activity success? Um, if that's the Scott Buchanan that I, I think it is, uh, what's up, buddy? Uh, <laughs> I think Scott still lives in DC. Scott and I were friends in high school uh, through Key Club. We were very active in, in uh, that service organization. Um, he, he was at RJ Reynolds High School when I was at Columbia High School and he's been a friend for a long time. Um, and Scott, I think, asked a question that he probably deep down knows the answer to because, yes, and I, and I got to be honest with you, John, I, I don't think that I, I don't think that I would be here having this conversation with you. I don't think that if, if I've achieved any reasonable modicum of professional success, I think a lot of it can be attributed to the fact that my dad was so absent in hindsight, um, obviously, subconsciously. I, I drove myself the way that I drove myself in, in my teenage years and certainly in my 20s. I was doing that to get my father to say, man, I'm proud of you. God, you just, you're just the best son. That, that's what I was doing. Um, and because I didn't get it for so long, I think I just probably kept harder and harder, trying harder and harder. Um, and, and so had he been the kind of dad that, that did that when the, like, you know, when I was seven or eight, 
I probably would have rested on my laurels and probably thought, ah, I'm great. I'm good and I'm good enough. Um, so it's, it's weird how that works, how, how right. you're, you're shaped in, in, in ways that you don't fully realize until you get older. So I guess in, in that way, I should be thankful uh, that he, he struggled the way that he did for so long. You know, parenthetically, I have a theory. American presidents tend to come from one of two very stark backgrounds. Mm -hmm. There's either a very powerful, engaged father or virtually no father at all. Nothing in between. N almost nothing in between. Uh, ju just since 1960, for instance. So Kennedy has a father, very engaged. Johnson's father was in the state legislature. Nixon's father was very hostile and, and not uh, particularly warm. Neither Gerald Ford nor Bill Clinton knew their fathers. Their names, neither Bill Clinton nor Gerald Ford were born Bill Clinton and Gerald Ford. Uh, and President Reagan's father was an alcoholic, uh, shoe salesman. The Bushes, of course, have the opposite. It's just, it's Obama. Uh, it's, it's, if you're raising a normal child, they probably won't become president, but that's okay. Uh, there's no problem there. Uh, what I'm hearing from you is I either need to be, I need to, I, I should become a helicopter dad, or I should take the route that my father took. I would recommend the helicopter so Lindsay won't get mad. Uh, so here's a good question. Uh, and it occurred to me too. Um, how did your dad's addiction impact your relationship with alcohol? Do you take, do you talk about adult beverages and responsible consumption with your kids? Probably not yet. I would well, yeah, no, because there's, there's seven and four. Um, but it's, it's funny because um, it, it did not shape it early on. It does now. When I went off to college, um, and part of this was because my mother was so strict. I mean, she was so strict. Um, when, I got, when I got to Wofford, I, I didn't, I had, I think I had a beer, I had a couple of drinks at key club functions in high school. I had never been drunk until I got to college in the first three days. And I drank excessively for, I'd say the first two and a half, maybe, maybe two, two and a half years of college. Uh, and at that point, my dad was, I mean, that was a peak of his drinking. And then we had a neighbor that lived across the street from us when I would go home, a guy named Joe Visconti, um, my, one of my dad's only friends back then. We would sit in his garage and we would sit around and have beers. And I thought how, I thought it was really cool to have you know, some beers with my dad and, and Joe. Um, I, I drank as much as my dad, as often as my dad did, John, probably until... I remember being in Columbia in my late twenties and, and thinking this is when I started seeing a therapist on a somewhat regular basis, thinking that I recognizing that I was developing the kind of relationship with alcohol that my dad had developed and it scared the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. And I stopped drinking cold for a while and then started to, um, started to, 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 you know, get back into more social drinking. And the same thing happened um, when I got to Washington for, uh, and uh, I started to go out after the show. I, I, I'd finish at 11 um, and I'd go out with friends from work. And because of the shift, I didn't have to be up until like 10 or 11. I'd go out and, you know, a couple of times a week, I'd drink too much. Um, and then I, again, I sort of recognized it and pulled back. And then uh, when we moved to Connecticut, this is probably five, six years ago. I mean, this is before Dell was born. Um, and our shifts were so weird. Lindsay was, she was doing like sports center late at night. And I found myself in this strange new place by myself for large, large swaths of time and started drinking too much. There have been periods in my life where I've recognized uh, that the alcohol was getting the better of me. And and, and I've been able to, to, to pull back with the help of, of, of some other folks and stop. Now I have a healthy relationship with it. Uh, but I think now it's more so a function of 
I have two small children. I just don't have the free time to drink like I used to. Uh, but I worry about it. I worry about it more for my children because you know this. I mean, addiction, uh, it's genetic. It's passed on. I, had a, I also had a very unhealthy relationship with gambling uh, back in the mid-2000s. And I, in the book, I write about my dad's uh, gambling addiction, which really, th- that really probably came closer to destroying our family than the alcohol did when video poker was a scourge in South Carolina. And back in, I remember 2005, I'd started to make some, some decent money and bought a house and um, I had some friends who were always wanting to travel, uh, go to Vegas. I went to Vegas three times in nine months. I'd, I'd managed to find myself a bookie. Um, and I'll never forget, I had to, um, I'd gotten a bond and I had to ask my dad for help. Hmm. 2005, 2006. I was earning a good wage, and it, but I had started gambling a good wage. And, um, and I, I had to, my dad came, I'll never forget this. My dad came over to this, this house that I bought about a year and a half before. I had to ask him for money. I'd never asked my dad for money before. Um, and, and he said, well, what's, you know, what's going on? And I, for whatever reason, that moment, I felt like I probably needed to tell somebody and I told him that I'd gotten in some, some trouble gambling and not a man of many words. My dad said, okay, I'm, I'll give you the money. You got to cut that shit out um, because it'll take over your life. And you know that and blah, blah. And, and the, the reprimand or the, the sermon might've lasted two minutes, John Meacham. Yeah. That, was, that was all I needed. Yeah. Um, so. That's it. So bring us home here. Um, what's the message you want folks to take away? Uh, I know from personal experience that books are hard. Uh, you've got a day job, you've got a family, you've got stuff to do. This obviously was uh, a passion of yours and continues to be self-evidently. What's the, what's the message for us? I, I wrote the book to, as, as cheesy and hokey and trite as it may sound, I wrote the book to help people. And by that, I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, you, you probably know this, but I'm not a really public person. I've got a public job. I don't like to, to talk about uh, my family or myself or, or, or from whence I've come. Um, but, but when my dad got clean in 2018, he and I uh, would frequently talk about how remarkable his story was that a guy who had been drinking the way he had been drinking for, for 45 years, uh, gambling, had, had, had given, given up both cold turkey, a man who had become estranged from not just our family, but pretty much society at large, all of a sudden, at 67, becomes an entirely different person. Entirely different person, thanks to an inpatient treatment program and God's grace, and a village that never gave up. And when I say never gave up, I don't mean that there weren't periods where we didn't write him off, but we always, we always came back to trying to save him. And the last time we tried was the time that it, it, it stuck. And, and the book only it came out on Tuesday. I have heard from, not an exaggeration, hundreds of people since then who have said, I've got a, got a dad, or I've got a mom, or I've got a sibling, or I've got a child that they, they, they struggle mightily with, with addiction and, and we, we, we'd written them off. The book is, is for folks who've done that because you shouldn't. You can't give up on someone that you love uh, no matter how long they've been climbing that mountain. Um, so I, it's, I, I want that to be the message. I also uh, want people uh, to understand the power of forgiveness. And that when you, for me at least, when I unburdened myself with, with this book and, and therapy, but with this book, when I unburdened myself and forgave my father uh, publicly, and because I wanted this to sort of be, I want to give my, fa- my father his flowers while he's still alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, because for years he struggled with, he, and, and still does, he struggles with this idea of, my God, I wasted so much time. Mm-hmm. I could have been, I could have been, this kind of father. And he would, he would, every time, every other time we talked to him, he would get emotional. And it was, it was driven by this guilt that he felt. 
I wanted him to understand that all is forgiven. Um, it's a book about forgiveness. It's a book about resiliency. It's a book about redemption. It's a book about addiction. Um, but it's got a happy ending. God bless you, my friend. Well done. Thank well, you. Thank you for this. Uh, I appreciate you. Uh, honestly, it, it's uh, yeah, Craig and I are fellow Southerners, and uh, while I can't match him story for story, I we could have gone a lot longer if I'd tried. <laughs> so I understand. A competition, my friend. I, no, no, I understand, and it's a. Um, the capacity of grace, the capacity for grace is so important and so hard and it's a daily struggle and you've helped a innumerable people uh, in that struggle. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate you more than you know. All right, buddy. And thank you uh, to Politics and Prose. Julia. Buy lots of books from Politics and Prose, <laughs> mostly by Melvin. Uh, but uh, Jane Austen, Anthony Trollope. By <laughs> I happen to have. Yeah, that's called long rolling in our time, my friends. <laughs> it's not signed. I think you can get you can actually get signed copies of my book. John Meacham does. <laughs> and of course, we here at Politics and Prose sincerely want to thank Craig Melvin, John Meacham, and our audience out there for tuning in and with your thoughtful questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring you this incredible programming, and we wouldn't be able to host these types of events without the book sales to support them. So we encourage you to follow the link in the chat to get your signed copy of POPs, learning to be a son and a father, or just visit us at politics-prose.com. And while you're there, you can check out the rest of our events calendar to see what's coming up this summer. You won't want to miss it. And from our shelves to yours, we hope you're out there staying safe, staying strong, and of course, staying well-read. We will see you next time.